And while everybody is joining us too, I think what I am going to do is mention if you want to join us in the Slack community, if you're not already there, we'd love to have you. It is a great place for us to discuss everything ML ops. So if you're looking to up your game, your ML ops game, or anything really in the data science, machine learning engineer, and now data engineering space, we talk about it all there. We share resources with each other. There's some really smart minds in there that's one thing that i can't stress enough there's some great people that you know past speakers are in there and they are really generous with their time and their help they give their help uh for anybody who's stuck so get in there and ask questions if you have any about your own projects or just ml ops theory what you find is a best practice and we also share all the old meetups there so it's a great place to be I think Chris just put it in the Slack, but uh, he can put it again so that we all have it. And yeah, there we go. Thanks, Chris. And there we go. Cool. So let's get it cracking. Dan Sullivan, thank you very much for being here with us. This is such a pleasure. I am so thankful that you are spending the time and coming to talk to us today. I know that we talked what a few months ago and Ooh. you were you were super helpful when we talked then. It was obvious to me that you knew your stuff and when I started this ML Ops community, you were one of the first people that I thought about trying to get on here because oh. you were you just you have such a presence and you're so prolific when it comes to what you do, how you put out all this content and all these teachings. And so um, for anybody that doesn't know who Dan is, I just want to give him a quick introduction. And I want to let you know that it's a very special day here because Dan has just released a new book and it is on the it's on google cloud and data engineering with that um and what we're doing is we're going to be having a book giveaway so dan and i came together and we thought what would be a great way to give something to the community and get your book get the book out there more and so in the slack channel that we have and also on linkedin if there are any horror stories i think the question that we asked was I, um the exact question let me see if i can find it but it was something along the lines of what was the most difficult or most painful that you've ever had to clean data with was that it let yeah that's basically the idea yeah yeah it just yeah so it right was on. exactly <laughs> what was the worst job of preparing data cleaning data sets in machine learning that you've ever encountered and why. And so if you wanna put an example into the chat here, that's fine. Or you can go into the Slack community and write on that thread. At the end of the week, we're gonna be choosing one horror story that is worthy of getting a free <laughs> book. <laughs> so Dan, again, thanks for being here. I'm, I'm really excited for this. And we're gonna be talking mainly today about how being a data engineer can be advantageous for data scientists. Yes. And so before we get started on anything, I just want to know, how do you do it with so much content, so much course material? <laughs> You've got like, what is it, 10 courses on LinkedIn? Yeah, about 10, 10 or yeah. maybe 12. There's one, one's about to come out, another there advanced SQL one. You yeah. just released a book. You've got all yeah. kinds of publications. It is incredible to me and us mere mortals what you're doing in the data science, data architecture, data engineering, and you've even done DevOps for machine learning. This is yeah. all, all this stuff you're doing. How is that possible? I think the key is being old. You know, I've been doing this for a long time. So it's like, you know, it just accumulates, you know, it never goes away, the content on the web. So uh, I've been writing for probably a little over 20 years. So part of it is just, I've just been doing it a long time. And part of it is I'm, I got really fast at it after a while. 
and I'm and I'm fortunate. My wife is a writer. She's a poet. She she's the one that convinced me to take a crack at writing 20 years ago, or a little over wow. that. So, yeah. So I'm I'm I have a lot of uh, a, you know expert help at my side as well. Anytime I need it. That's so cool. That is that's really yeah. nice to have a little team like that. And so if anybody wants to just go ahead and grab his book, I just put a link to it in the chat. Uh, because if you don't want to tell your horror story about preparing data or you don't want to spend the time explaining how big of a horror story it was, go ahead and click that link and grab the book. Um, the, the thing that I normally start with and that I wanted to ask you is how you got into tech. You say you've been in it for a long time. So can you break down what yeah. got you excited with it and how that worked out? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, funny because I almost didn't get into tech. And uh, basically, I started working with computers when I got into college as an undergrad, as a freshman. And, uh, you know, I, I basically was taking, all, taking computer science because I figured I, I need to get a job when I get out. Uh, and that, you know, that was looked like the best way to do it because my, my real interest was like in political theory, philosophy, but I figured I'm not going to get a job doing that. And, uh, and I hated my first computer science course, absolutely hated it, swore I'd never take another one again. Uh, and then I took a, a math modeling class, mathematical modeling class, and just loved it. Had a great professor, she was fantastic. It was like, okay, all right, I, I, maybe this isn't so bad after all. And uh, yeah, so then I got hooked, and this was uh, before AI winter. AI was really exciting at the time. It was back in the 80s, 90s. And you know, when I got out, I got to work with a a consulting company in the Boston area doing AI, mostly natural language processing, a little bit of financial services expert systems. And uh, then I went, went back to school for a couple of years, did some more natural language processing, and then, you know, AI winter hit, and then it was like, okay, I could either go into, you know, most of us like either went into object-oriented software engineering or sort of the data side of the world, and I just took the data fork on that one. And, uh, and I've been loving it ever since. Wow. So you have some serious experience. I knew you had some experience, but that is an incredible roadmap or journey that you've gone through. Now, can you talk to us a bit about what changes you saw from the beginning and when AI was really interesting and then when AI hit, AI winter, I should say, mm -hmm. hit, and how that affected a bit more in depth? Yeah. Um... What was really interesting, like in the 80s and 90s, and you know, before I was in it, like in the 70s, um, AI was really synonymous with like symbolic AI, you know, working with expert systems or, or like with natural language processing, you know, you build a parser similar to like you would build with a compiler, not at all the way we do it now with like deep learning neural networks. Um, so it was very kind of, it was a little bit clunky. Looking back now, it feels like, wow, we were just like cobbling Legos together and, you know, you know, made some things that looked good. And they were, you know, some things were actually useful. I mean, they, they really did work, um, but they weren't, they didn't have a lot of resiliency. They were, systems were typically really brittle. Um, yeah, they were hard to, hard to write. I think, you know, there was no platforms. So uh, things that were like, we take for granted like Spark or Scikit-learn and things like that. I mean, there was just nothing like that. Um, you know, the big advance was like getting a standard common list, everybody agreeing this is the syntax for common list instead of having like four different common lists running around um, and things like that. So, yeah, so I think, you know, the kind of the, the building up the body of knowledge and the tools is a big piece, I think, um, you know, getting, getting away from the prejudice around neural networks. There was a real prejudice um, and it was very much like a, dominated by like an East Coast AI mentality like the MIT school, which is a little bit different. Like Stanford at the time, like in the eighties was very into like logic. MacArthur was into like, you know, some people were thinking it's like, oh, you know, first order logic, that's the key for AI. And, you know, people on the East Coast were like, no, it's symbolic. And it's like, and then there were a few, you know, people here and there saying, well, we should be looking at these neural nets and multi-layer perceptrons. And it was just the people like, no, that's, you know, that's not real AI. And it's, you know, so it's ironic. It's like, now it's like, okay, we have enough data to work with. We have the computational resource. People have figured out how to do backprop over very deep networks. It's like, okay, a lot of the really hard nuts have been cracked. And it's like, oh, those people were right. 
you know, that at least for now, this is at this point in time, you know, it looks like they're right. But uh, yeah, so I think, um, I think I've only seen one paper maybe like in the last six months that's um, kind of talked about how with like a deep learning network, you can start to build something resembling like the symbolic mechanisms. Like somebody did uh, um, integration, like an integration solver using a deep learning neural network, which was like a very symbolic, that's like the height of symbolic like AI or pattern manipulation was getting like integration done. And uh, so, yeah, so that's like canned up and stuff like MATLAB or uh, some of the other like math programs. But yeah, I think, you know, hopefully we'll see, you know, a little bit of what we learned in the symbolic era start to, to get attached with what we know now with deep learning to do some really even more exciting stuff. Yeah. And so when did you see the change from like when AI winter was starting to fade? Did you notice anything about how that it was like, okay, now it's, it's all right to try and get back into this? Oh, um, yeah, you know, I don't think I realized I was getting back into it. Um, I think I started doing more AI and NLP kind of stuff when I got into working in life sciences and I was working in genetics and proteomics and we were dealing with, um, you know, obviously, you know, just large volumes of data and uh, with my background in natural language processing, you know, it, I immediately was kind of gravitated toward like natural language processing in the biomedical literature because there's, there's just so much material out there. It's just very hard and to, for, for researchers, any scientists, anybody interested in a particular domain to keep up. And uh, so I started kind of poking around with that again, sort of on the side, I was doing most, more like um, data architecture stuff, like how do you scale up? This is like early days of big data. How do you scale up when, you know, Oracle, you hit the wall with Oracle and you need, you know, a non-relational database, things like that. But then I, you know, I, it's always nice to be doing two or three things, you know, having a few different projects that, in a totally different area. So the NLP was a, a good option. So that was like around 2006, 2008, I started doing it. So yeah, there was maybe like a 15 year period where I wasn't doing a lot of AI stuff. So yeah, and but it's good to be back. Yeah, I, I believe it. So I want to ask you about this course that you have on LinkedIn, the ML or DevOps for ML. And what made you go out and make that course? Uh, actually, somebody at LinkedIn, one of the uh, editors at LinkedIn suggested it, and um, which means there must have been market demand for it. That's, that is my suspicion is like, hey, what do you think of this? I was like, oh, yeah, you know, for sure. Because like, there were, you know, ML, when you're, when you're doing it, like doing research and working in your Jupyter notebook and kind of doing exploration, it's very interactive. It, it's a very different process from having a system in production that you know you monitor you're you're regularly checking up on people are depending on their dependencies it's it's a different totally different world and it was and i thought it was a great idea that, that the editor had come up with so that was the the genesis of that one yeah that's so cool and i think it's such a great thing to have out there and it's so true we've had so many people talk about that how it's a whole different beast when you're playing around with these ML models or when you actually need to get them out and have them live and keep yeah. the, you know, who's in control of the security side of this, who's in control yeah. of keeping the patches updated, who's in control of yeah. everything that goes around this, not just the model and making sure the model isn't drifting or what's going on with that. So, right. Um, Go ahead. If, if oh, yeah, yeah. No, I was going to say, yeah, exactly what you're describing. And it's very similar to what, like, software engineers do all the time. This is, you know, you know, version control and, you know, automated testing and, you know, incremental releasing. And it's just, you know, and software engineers have the tools. They have the, you know, continuous integration pipelines and, you know, and monitoring, application monitoring, infrastructure monitoring. But it's new from from an ML perspective. It's a, it really, as you said, it's really a different beast. Yeah, and one thing that people have just been echoing each week when we come on here is just how much more complicated it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's really complicated. I mean, it really is. And this is this is really the software engineering side of it. It's almost like you take off your ML hat and you put on your software engineering hat or your DevOps hat. Um, yeah, because like uh, you know, I feel like you know a lot of 
folks in ML and data science, um, you know, their background might be more like around math oriented or statistics and, you know, specifically. Um, and then they pick up, you know, R, Python and things like that. And so they, you know, people with that background who come in from like that angle don't have the software engineering background. And it's just like, you know, those of us that come from the software engineering side, we don't necessarily have as much of the math background. So this is one of the reasons, things I, I really am a big advocate for is basically like team or collaborative developments because there's just, there's so much to know and nobody can know it all. And, you know, and if you try to, you just like, your head's going to explode. I mean, it's just too much and yeah. it's going to change once you get it it's going to change and you're not going to be able to keep up on, you know, whatever the cool thing is, whatever for you, what's the cool thing? Is it the, is it the deep learning algorithm? Is it like getting in, coming up with like experimenting with new types of, of nodes or activation functions or something like that? Or is it, you know, scaling up a, a model to, to handle, you know, tens of thousands of, of requests per second kind of thing, you know? And yeah. Well, that was, it was like you're reading my mind because I had the next question was something like, how do you stay up to date? How do you, because you are like the quintessential full stack. You have data engineering skills. You have this DevOps for ML skills. You have data science skills, a bit of software engineering. How can you keep all of that and stay relevant with all of that? Yeah, I think it, I think it is. I, I shift focus. Like sometimes I'll be working more on the ML side and I'll be into that. And other times it's going to be more like data engineering and Google cloud and I'll be into that. Um, it's, yeah, it's really hard to like to stay up. Like I, you know, was, have been working on these Google books. Uh, the one that just came out is the third uh, that I did in the last two years. And it's pro you know, and it's hard. I, I like, so that's where my focus has been. And I'm just starting to get back to do more ML stuff. Um, but like in the past two years, I, you know, the number of visits to archive to see, you know, what are the cool papers is probably, you know, plummeted to like 10% of what it was before I started the books. Um, so yeah, no, I definitely can't stay up on all of the stuff all the time. It, I very much kind of hop around. Yeah, so that's, so depending on which week it, you know, what month it is, you know, I might be up on something or completely lost and haven't heard the latest thing. <laughs> well, talking about these books and, and how it's with Google Cloud, what made you want to go into Google Cloud so deep? Uh, I got into this, yeah, when I was working in the life sciences and uh, I, I got this job at a research institute to basically for like doing data architecture, but I really didn't know a lot about life sciences. So I started taking courses and I got hooked. I really liked it. So I ended up doing my PhD in genetics and computational biology. And um, I was working on my dissertation and I was like, okay, I need, I need resources. Like I need cloud resources. And I started in AWS and um, cause I figured, Oh, you know, I'll just use like, uh, if you're familiar with AWS, Elastic MapReduce, it's their hosted Spark Hadoop cluster. And it was just such a pain to, to deal with all the networking issues. And, and I hate networking. I'm not good at a lot of things, but networking is a particular standout. And so having to like configure firewall rules and stuff like that, it was just like, it just felt like a waste of time. Cause it's like, I, wanna, I just wanna get my data, get it in there, you know, write my programs, do my analysis and get out. Um, and so part of it was out of frustration. Um, with AWS that I kind of jumped over and took a look at uh, Google and and I was immediately hooked it was like so much easier the networking is so much cleaner it's very easy to like spin up clusters um, it's just like it at that time it was like it didn't feel like I was impeded in any way by the tools I was using so that's how I got hooked on it and then I just stayed there it's just like why I haven't needed to go anywhere else um, yeah so I feel really comfortable there. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And it, it answers the other question that I had is what advantages do you feel it has? Have you played around much with Azure and what that looks like? And, and yeah, I, I haven't. And I think, yeah, which is too bad. I think I really have not played with Azure, but I would love to like get in there and see some of the, especially like the NoSQL kind of the databases, data stores. I would love to know more about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I haven't worked in a place that's like, like a Windows centric shop, like a .NET shop, things like that. So um, I haven't been sort of pushed to, or, you know, 
oriented toward Azure from a work perspective, and I just I haven't picked it up on my own either. And when you're going deep into GCP, what are some of these, like, when you niche down into this, do you feel that these tools that GCP has to offer, they are universal? Like, if I were to learn real deep about GCP, could I then switch over to AWS with ease, or is it something that I would need to relearn everything? Uh, in some cases, a lot of it carries over. So if you're using like uh, in AWS, it's called EC2. It's where you go in and like spin up virtual machines and Google, it's called Compute Engine. It's very similar. Um, you know, if you're, if you're really um, good at it in one, you'll be good at it in the other. If you're coming from GCP and going to AWS, you might find you have to do more. There's more configuration maybe with EC2, although that may have changed. It's really, it's been a while. It's probably been a couple of years since I really had been hands-on with AWS, but um, so any anytime you're working like, yeah, with VMs, you're probably going to find a lot of parallels. Um, if you're working a lot with Docker and you Dockerize your apps and you're running them in Kubernetes, then you're, it's going to be very similar going back and forth. You're going to use Kube Control to work with the Kubernetes cluster in either place. Um, there may be some differences, like both um, have uh, hosted Hadoop Spark clusters. Mm -hmm. It's called Dataproc and GCP, EMR and AWS. So those things are similar. And um, yeah, a lot of the knowledge you have in one will carry over to the other. Um, but then there are differences, like Google has a serverless data warehouse platform called BigQuery, which is like their petabyte scale data warehouse. It's a columnar data store scales really well um, if you're going into data warehousing and you don't you know don't want to run your own cluster and you know you know send send large amounts of your you know your your revenue to oracle to fund a data warehouse you know people go to bigquery in uh gcp on the aws side uh, they have redshift which is based on postgres it's basically like a scalable postgres so that's you know those are two different beasts right there um, I don't know if AWS has something comparable to Bigtable, which is a wide column data store, kind of like Cassandra, or mm. they have similar models. I'll put it that way. They're based on the sparse multidimensional matrix. So yeah, so Bigtable, you know, it's, it's not serverless. You have to, you know, you specify a number of nodes, how many servers you want, but it's, it's managed. So it's very low ops from a DevOps perspective. And so what do you feel like are some of, these key advantages in GCP and what makes you really excited about working with it? I think the, the biggest thing I like working about it, working with it is that Google is consi you know, consistently pushes down the level of overhead and tedium that you have to deal with. Like, uh, like they developed Kubernetes because they needed something efficient. You know, they, they figured out you know, containers were more efficient than running VMs, so they went down there, and then they had thousands of, you know, these um, containers running, and they needed some kind of orchestration mechanism, and so, you know, over the years, you know, that work became Kubernetes. Um, so, so there are all those tools there, like in Google, and now there, those tools, like Kubernetes, are available, you know, anywhere you want, but now you also have options like Cloud Run, which is just, here's your container, just, you know, put it in your, um, in your pipeline and deploy it to Cloud Run. Right now, Cloud Run just runs uh, stateless containers, but it just, it's just one more step toward, I don't have to think about servers. You know, like my goal is to, you know, in an ideal world, I would never have to think about servers or operating systems and stuff like that. Um, Cause it's just, it's just not a value add. You know, like when I'm wrestling, like if I have the, you know, I don't have a, an Ubuntu version of, Linux that I'm working with, and so there's some package that's not there that I'm depending on, but it's always, always there for the you know if you're in Ubuntu, it's like I don't want to think about those kind of things, you know. Yeah. Um, it's a lot more tedious. Yes, yeah. I mean, we have better things to do with our lives. Yeah, <laughs> like write books. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> that's it. And just so everybody's clear, neither of us are getting paid to talk this good about Google. Oh yeah, um, no. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but no. if they want to pay us, you know, we may be open to it. So let us know, Google. <laughs> That's uh, right. No. Yeah. <laughs> just so just so everybody knows, this is fully like non-biased information. So on that note, are there any downfalls that you see with GCP? 
Oh, sure. I think um, th there's, you know, Google doesn't have a lot of the variety of the services like AWS. There's, there's like a service for everything. Um, so, and Google is not like that. It's more, you, you go deep on a few things. So it's like you have the building blocks. You've got, you know, you've got scalable clusters, you've got cloud orchestration, you have cloud pub sub for messaging and, you know, kind of decoupling services and allowing for scalability. They've done a really good job making it easy to scale. Um, and also like multi-regional scaling, you know, so those kind of like very broad building blocks are there, but like the fine grain things like here's a service that does X, you know, and it's something very specific that you might need. AWS is much better at that. You know, they've, they've really kind of responded to the market. Like anytime there's a market need, they will fill it. Okay. And because all the rage these days is Kubeflow, I want to know, have you experienced any of Kubeflow? Have you been working with it on GCP? I haven't, no, no, I haven't been working with Kubeflow at all yet. Okay. So that is, that's a new one for me. Yeah, no, okay, I'm looking cool. forward to it, but yeah, just, it's really, it's been a couple of years now since I've been diving, you know, being into the ML side of the world and it's, I'm just starting to get back to it. Nice. So that, that may be right, my I had, I had to ask because I know that it generates a lot of buzz and we've been hearing a lot of people talk about it. And a few weeks ago we had on um, Josh Bottom who was talking to us about Kubeflow and, and it seemed like there was a lot of traction there. Uh, so, and I know it's primarily made for GCP. It can work on all of them, right? But it's the... Yeah, that's my understanding. But again, that's like one of the things I'm kind of like, I'm watching like out of the peripheral, I'm peripheral vision and haven't really paid attention to, but it, uh -huh. yeah. Um, no, I'd, I'd love to know more. And the next question that I had was uh, two we last week or two weeks ago, we had Sarav on and he was talking to us about these four different types of personas that he's been seeing around. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And one would be like a data analysis who's trying to get these answers quick, prove out the business, uh, mm -hmm. the business viability of a certain problem and using ML on it or not, or um, using some kind of data analytics, data software uh, or data. Um, and then you have like the software engineer who's that classic Dev DevOps persona. You have mm -hmm. a data scientist who's like you were talking about earlier is more into the math not really mm. doing much programming. That's not their strong point. And then you mm -hmm. have like an ML engineer who's a bit of a crossover between the data scientist. He can maybe play around with models, build models, but also has that DevOpsy side. And yeah. now looking at this from those four personas and when you're looking at it as a, as, from a data engineering point, do you feel that there is one that is more apt or is it would be easier to shift to uh, learning more about data engineering or all of them maybe, or which one will benefit the greatest? Yeah, I would say probably the, the closest might be software engineering because so many of the, the processes um, that, that people have developed for software engineering, like agile teams and small incremental improvements and, um, fit really well with data engineering um, because it's, again, it's like small teams or even one person can do a lot. Um, a lot of the focus on things like monitoring, having things in production, how do you scale them? How do you make them reliable? How do you make them resilient to, to you know, small failures? Those are all things that software engineers get exposed to and it's really useful on a data engineering side. Uh, on the other hand, like an ML engineer or somebody who's like a data scientist, it's, they have advantages in that they're used to actually working with the data. Like a data engineer is just like, it's like the, you know, we're moving the data, you know, it's like put it in this box and we'll move the box and get it where it needs to be. The data scientists and ML engineers and the, and the ML practitioners, they're the ones that are like opening the box. What are we gonna do with this? How do we mix it up with other boxes? Um, there is, typically like more domain knowledge involved there, like both math, like you got to understand the math, but you also have to understand the domain. Um, I've heard people say, oh, well, like with machine learning, like you're building a classifier, you don't even have to, you don't really have to be an expert in whatever the domain is, but that's true in like the simplest case, but the data is never 
the way it needs to be, or very rarely is it the way it needs to be to put it into an algorithm. And so you have to understand. Um, and sometimes it requires like, you know, if you're working in financial services, you have to understand the language like people and finance use or in, in life science, you have to understand, well, what is the measurement? What is this thing? What's the scale? You know, I mean, even like really simple things, this sound, might sound really simple, but it's like, it can really screw you up. It's like the, oh, is this in centimeters or inches kind of thing. And that's, but it happens all the time. I mean, depending on the domain, um, where, where you really have to dive deep into understanding what the problem space is so you can understand what the data is, is representing so that you can then manipulate it in the way that's appropriate. Yeah, so diving deeper into that, what do you feel are some of the biggest advantages of a data scientist learning data engineering or um, a DevOps person learning dev data engineering? I would say like for a data scientist, a learning data engineering is uh, like having a skill set. It's like now, now you're going to move up from like a handsaw to a chainsaw, like you have power tools and you can do much more like because data engineering, it's more like, okay, how, I have really large volumes of data and I either want to do something like streaming analytics, which I, you know, maybe you understand the math, you, you know, like can, can pick the right algorithm, give it a scenario. You like, oh, this is how I'll analyze it but you might run into problems because the data is so large and you, you kind of spend a lot of time moving around files and you're not quite sure, you know, how do I clean up this file and do some you know, feature engineering at scale? That's the kind of thing you learn when you start to think about data engineering and learn those skills. And do you feel it's realistic to have someone that is able to do it all? Like we were talking earlier about just how full stack is really outrageous these days. Yeah. And so for a data scientist to focus on how to get their models into production and then how to monitor them and then going back and saying, how do I get this data cleaning and all that is, yeah. is it realistic for one person to look at it from the very, very beginning till the very end? Or uh, what do you feel about yeah. that? Yeah. I mean, my feeling is not, at, 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 not at depth. It's more like a T. You can, you know, across the top, you can have a good understanding, like um, of all of the the pieces of the puzzle. But you know, you typically, I, I find it helps to like go deep on one of them. Um, and I think there is like a real parallel between our work in like uh, data engineering, data science, machine learning, and software engineering, where people talk about full stack, like. You know, some people are really good with UIs and some people are really good with visualization and working with, you know, like uh, business domain experts and massaging the data and understanding it. That's really like the front end from an ML data engineering perspective. And then there are people that are more like the, the back end services who understand databases and, you know, moving large volumes of data. And, um, so I, I also, I don't, I mean, I would never say, if somebody self-identified as full stack engineer, I would never question them, but I could never be a full stack engineer. Like I, you know, I would be good at one end or the other or something in between, but not all of it. So, and I feel like that's the same way with data science and data engineering. It's just, it's too big of a domain to, to do it all. And I think we do, yeah, I think, you know, this is a problem like the, the culture, I think out of like software engineering and like ha stuff is, has developed over the years where it's like, you know, you feel like you have to know it all, right? It's, it's not safe to say, I don't know. And I say, I don't know all the time. And it's like, it's, and it's okay. It's like, really, people should not feel like, you know, they're not good enough. They're not going to be a good data scientist. Their career won't advance unless they know all of this stuff. Like, no, I mean, I am an example of just kind of bouncing around. I'm good at one thing at one time. And, you know, that's, you can, you can. And <laughs> that is so reassuring to hear because, you who have created all these courses, written all these books, you are saying that it's all right to say, I don't know. And oh yeah, 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 yep. yep, yeah, absolutely. And it's okay to like learn something and then forget it. You know, I mean, I could, like if I had to do Spark now, I'd have to, I really, I'd spend two days with, you know, just reading all the docs or, you know, grab a, a Manning book or something on, you know, Spark in action just to get back up to speed. Cause I just, you know, I can't remember all this stuff. Um, and I can't know it all. I mean, I, one of the great things like working at, um, uh, right now at New Relic, it's like so many people there have 
you know, are really in, in depth, like in engineering and math. And it's so great to talk to people. Like, like there's one person who's like really good with histograms. He like knows all the algorithms, cutting edge research. And like, that's his niche. And it's like, that's fantastic. But, you know, but he also doesn't need to be the person that knows, well, what's the right visualization package in Python that I should be, you know, and which, which visualization should I use? It's like, no, somebody else know, is good at that. You know, so. Yeah. And it's just yeah creating great teams that can really complement each other yep yeah and, uh, and building on other what other people do somebody i saw this t-shirt somewhere like another day of cutting and pasting from stack overflow and i thought that was like so right on the money it's like yeah i do that all the time right i don't you know i need a, a you know a shim or something to help me get from a to b and i you know don't know how to do it but somebody has done it before and i really appreciate the fact they you know take the time to put it out there like on a, on a forum like that. Yeah, no shame in cutting and pasting. Uh, not at all. Uh, so, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. I'm just wondering if go. you have seen, so I wanna jump, in a minute, I wanna jump into what you're doing at New Relic and how maybe in your own life, knowing more about data engineering and data science has helped you in, in a practical sense. But before we get there, I'm, I'm wondering if you've, if you can tell us about any time where, this is a question I love to ask, and it's when something has gone horribly wrong, how it went wrong. You don't have to mention any names or say which company you were at, but just what went wrong, how did this happen, and maybe something that we could learn from so we don't make the same mistake. Oh, yeah. Yep. I can. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have probably have several examples. I think the best one, or at least the one that burns the most, like it's still like, I really feel like I really screwed that one up was um, when I was working in the Genetics Research Institute and doing natural language processing. Um, the goal was to help um, curators, basically people like who have, you know, or like molecular biologists who read all these papers and kind of distill it down and um, basically, you know, annotate a lot of the data that we're like generating from like, you know, analyzing genomes and things like that. And so the goal was to basically help them be able to understand the literature faster. And so that they, they could essentially scale up. Um, and it was an absolute train wreck because I focused on the NLP, the computer science, the, the algorithms and oh, look at, you know, I got a great F1 score with this algorithm and it just, and so we had tools at the end that we thought were great, were cool, you know, were good for like getting papers published and talking to colleagues about. And it was a total disconnect from the way they work, like the curators work. So it's like this idea of, oh, I'll, I'll build this great technical tool and everybody will come to it. It's like, no, no, I mean, you have to, you have to bring your tool to the, to the end user. They're, they're busy enough struggling and, you know, they, yeah, so it was really a mess. I, I should have involved like those people more uh, earlier on. So I really value people who have like user experience, UX experience and understand like human factors, human interaction kind of things. Those people are super, super valuable. And it's, uh, you know, I'm sorry I haven't worked more with them, but yeah, so <laughs> please, yeah, so that's my, that's my train wreck story for the morning, for the day. Yeah, those guys, uh, they didn't care much about your F score. <laughs> no, they didn't. You're right. It didn't help anybody solve. It did not solve their problem, you know. And that's so. Like, what was I doing? Why was I bothered then? So yeah, that, that was the thing. You hear it time and time again, right? Like, make sure you're actually solving a business problem. It doesn't matter what yeah. cool algorithm you're using or how fast you can get it into production. If it's not right. really doing anything, then yeah, what are you there for? Right. And it's okay. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, a lot of these things are intellectually interesting and they're challenging and you want to do them. And that's great. I mean, I still, that, that's still good. It's just, but, you know, it just needs to be, you know, balanced with this idea of like, you know, we're building a bridge and we got to build it all the way across the river. And, you know, so we can't go 90% of the way. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah which I've done many times. <laughs> And then you go back uh, <laughs> like, or just abandon ship. <laughs> yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, what I'm wondering now is a little bit about like how you manage CPU costs and cloud costs. And if being a data engineer or knowing a bit more about data engineering 
will help along those lines? Do you feel like that is something that where it will touch on and you will say, oh yeah, I can potentially save the company money if I know more about this? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, definitely. And in a couple of ways, um, just understanding scale, like, I mean, of course, if you're a data scientist, you're good with numbers, you're going to figure out, you know, you have a large volume of data, you're going to know, you know, if you're paying X per CPU hour, you know, you can ballpark and know, um, you know, what it's going to cost you. But um, what data engineering <laughs> helps you with is like, with data engineering, you forget to shut down the cluster and, you know, a couple days later, you have, you know, hundreds of dollars in charges, you know, so from a data engineer perspective, like I, I've done that, like I've, I've burned myself like that. Um, so part of it is just, you know, learning the um, sort of the hard lessons, like to avoid cost. Um, but also, if you're familiar with the capabilities of a, of a particular cloud, like AWS has spot instances, where you can bid um, like a lower price for a, a virtual machine, and AWS will let you have that machine, but they may pull it back at any time. So if you have a, a problem um, or where you have a solution that's resistant to that kind of failure, then using like spot instances on AWS or preemptible virtual machines on GCP, it could save you a lot of money. So that's where the, um, the data engineering can help. And also knowing tools like uh, Cloud Dataflow, it's, a, it's an Apache Beam runner. So if you're, you want to write uh, like a streaming or even batch processing and you want to use like Java or Python and you want to do it at scale and you don't want to mess around with spinning up your own servers, then Cloud Dataflow is a great option. So yeah, knowing the tools, knowing sort of the features in the specific clouds that will help you save money, I think those are two, two key things that you can get from data engineering. Wow, that's a great answer. And in case anybody has any more specific questions on this, feel free to put it in the chat and we'll get to it when we see it. Um, because half of the stuff Dan is saying right now just goes way over my head. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, it's great. Sorry. I'm, no, I'm learning so much. And that's why I love this because I get to learn so much from, from you who's an expert in this field. And it's great. But if there are others that are very far along this journey and they want to know more specifics, then feel free to ask more questions on it. Um, but until that happens, I've got more questions about sure. more managing the security side and how mm. data scientists and data engineers can play nice with the InfoSec guys and make sure yep. that everything passes all of the tests on security. And especially these yeah. days with GDPR and all of these regulations coming through, how can you recommend one would get better at that? That is a really important question. And it is, the short answer is, you know, think about the security and compliance implications right from the start. Um, it's, it's, you know, one of those things, it's much, easy, much easier to fix early on than farther down in the process. So I would, like, if you have anything like um, that might be data that's covered by regulation, so if you're, in, you know, using, personal health information or, you know, any kind of uh, personally identifying information, I would definitely recommend connecting with someone like InfoSec person in your organization. Um, like, I, you know, we work with some people on InfoSec. They are, they, they know what the compliance regulations are. They know what the corporation policies are and things like that. So it's great to just make early contact with those people because it's like, you know, going to somebody who has, has already solved the problem, at least a lot of the problems with working with the data. So it, it'll speed things up if you are, you know, kind of uh, collaborating with the InfoSec people right from the beginning. And at the very least, just like go dig up the policies, you know, find what's documented for your organization. And if you have questions, you know, find somebody and ask questions. But I would definitely say, you know, very first thing is just to understand right at the beginning what's um, what the issues are. And then the second thing is, is eliminate as much of that sensitive data from your, you know, the, the pool of data you're using as possible. Like if you don't need this, that, then just don't even have it. It's like, just, um, you know, and sometimes it's hard. You might be doing feature engineering, you're experimenting, you don't know what you need. 
So like when you're in the data science at early interactive, you're working in Jupyter Notebooks, trying to figure stuff out. Once you kind of get the model you, or you understand like the data, you might be able to eliminate some of the sensitive information. That's great if you can do that, by all means do it because the fewer copies that are of that data that are around, the fewer that need to be locked down and monitored and protected and audited. So yeah. That's wow, it. what a great insight. Yeah, and that's something that I'm sure many people know, but it's something if you're not doing or putting into practice, that's just, that's great to think about and to have it as a rule, you know, first rule of oh, thumb. Yep, yep, yeah. Cool, very cool. So now can you talk to us a bit about what you're doing at New Relic and how, what your role is, what, um, what kind of stuff you're getting into and, and how you're using this data scientist, architect, um, data engineer, how you're using all of this knowledge to in your day to day? Sure. Well, actually, this is my last week at New Relic. I've been there about four years. I'm shifting gears. I'm going to be working at uh, Peak Six Technologies starting next week. Uh -huh. um, but thank you. Yeah, but it's been great. It's been a great run. I'd say, you know, at New Relic, I'll just, you know, talk in very, you know, general terms. It's really um, been great to work with people who are, like I had mentioned really, like really good with the math, really. And these are also people that are really like excellent software engineers, um, really understand like high performance Java and things like that. And so it's been great to like be around them, watch them and understand how they build like streaming analytics, like New Relic is, for people that don't know, it's a, uh, observability platform, basically, you know, monitoring applications, infrastructure, and, you know, doing analysis on that. Um, and so part of it is analyzing this just like large volumes of data. Um, and there's, there's a big push last year. Yeah, I think it was last year New Relic acquired uh, a company um, that was focused primarily on ML and AI and like signal processing. So there's a lot of, uh, that company's now really kind of folded in, it's all mixed in and technology is like part of the New Relic platform now. So there's, there's really, New Relic's gonna push that, I think, and um, it's gonna be really interesting to see how, how um, you know, more and more AI is applied like in real time, that's what, that's going on there. So, and the data engineering there, a lot of it is just, you know, uh, a lot of the challenges around scale, you know, how do you scale up clusters to hundreds of nodes to handle this volume or, you know, how do you deal with, how do you scale up Kafka? Because, you know, you need to decouple a lot of these services and, you know, you have huge, you know, like Kafka clusters as well. So um, I think scalability was a big thing. I, I learned a lot about working with folks at Relic and also they're very focused on reliability there. So how do you make things resilient to failure is a really interesting problem. And that's another thing that I don't think about when I'm sort of wearing my data science hat. It's more like I'm, I'm more into the math and the problem and not the, okay, this thing needs to run constantly. It has to have, you know, whatever, 99.999 availability. How are we going to make that happen? And so they're, you know, so, the, and that's where data engineering comes in. That's, that's like pushing the boundaries of, of what I do at data engineering. So, yeah. So, and now I'm going to be doing similar kind of things, but more, you know, analytics, large data architecture, um, kind of thing. So I'm looking oh, forward so cool. to it. So cool. So uh, speaking of data architecture and all this, can you break down because I'm, and forgive me for my ignorance on this, but can you break down this whole idea of the data warehouse, the data lake, the data lake house, and what you've seen um, and the needs when, when one is needed over the other and, and the pros oh, and cons? Yeah. Yeah, like yeah, data warehouses have been around for a while. Like in their their nature, it's um, and they kind of grew out of the need for like businesses to be able to to basically do some like comparative analysis. Like if you're a retailer and you want to know, you know, what's the revenue for this store, you know, this month, and how does it compare to the same month last year? You know, transaction processing systems like we use like on a on like an e-commerce site. You know, where I might be doing all, you know, all this ordering and managing inventory and things like that. That's great for, for that process, but it's not good for answering these sort of analytical questions. So that's where data warehouses sort of why they evolved. 
and and they're still 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 definitely needed, and they're you know they're just getting larger. Um, data warehouses are highly structured, so there's um, there's a process called ETL or extraction transformation load or extraction load transfer is a variant of that, and it's basically about getting data out of the transaction processing systems. Uh, combining it, joining it with other related data, and getting into a data warehouse in a form that's useful for people who want to ask queries, like the kind I just mentioned. So again, it, it, there are a lot of parallels with data science, where you're getting data out of something, you're reformatting it, organizing it, um, linking it, and then doing some, asking some questions of it. Um, the data lake is sort of a, you know, a newer phenomenon, and it's basically at one end, it's sort of like just a, a I can't use the term warehouse. It's like a storage area for just data. You know, you just move it in in its raw form. And the idea being, I don't know if I need this data. It might be useful sometime in the future because some data scientist will say, do you have X? And we want to have that. Um, so data lake is like areas like uh, using like object storage, like AWS S3, uh, cloud storage and GCP and just storing the raw data, maybe lightly processed, you know, you like, you might make sure everything is like UTF-8 encoded, but not, you know, you don't link data in the data warehouse. It's not related, it's not structured. Um, that's really the difference. And, and uh, like so many things in, in computer science, uh, oh, thank you. Um, people get theological about them. It's like some people have these ideas like, oh, data lake's the way to go, or it should be a structured data lake, or no, data, data lakes suck. It's like, no, it's like, it's a tool. And, you know, so, um, yeah, so I think, you know, if in terms of just raw storage over time, like an archive, that's kind of how I understand data lake mm -hmm. and data warehouses where you start being more structured. Um, but it's a different kind of structure than we do in ML or data science. And I've, I've heard that the main amount of time you're spending on for a data scientist will spend like 80% of their time trying to clean the data and get the data. So the way that they want it mm -hmm. does, you kind of touched on it, but I'm just wondering, is there any tricks that being able to know data engineering can help in that? Um, yeah, it may help with things like scale. Like if you're, you know, um, you know, if if you're you're used to working like with um, like spreadsheets or like small pandas data frames and maybe manipulating data there, um, that's a great way to do it. I do that all the time. If you hit a certain scale, that's not going to work. And so you maybe you know make maybe a data engineer is familiar with like Linux command line and can use like set or awk these command line utilities for manipulating files. Um, so you might, so yeah, you can definitely help at scale at that level, or if it's even a bigger scale where, where you need, you know, like a pipeline, like a data flow, um, the, the data engineering can definitely help reduce the time, the time it takes to, to do, like just crank through the, the data cleaning and things like that and actually do the data. Um, it can also help with exploration. There are tools like, um, uh, data prep in the Google cloud, um, which allow you to, uh, like explore the data. Also, um, uh, Open Refine, I think that's the tool. Uh, yeah, I'll have to think about this one. But yeah, there there are tools out there that'll help you do like, you know, analyze the quality of data in a particular column. So you can get like a histogram of the distribution of values, how many null values, things like that. So yeah, so from a data engineering perspective, there are tools that you pick up as a data engineer that can be really useful for you, for you as a data scientist. And We've got three more minutes. I want to just make sure nobody has any questions in the chat. I've got one more question, but I'm leaving it open in case anybody has something to say or wants to ask Dan anything. Before we go, what's the best way to keep in contact with you? If somebody wants to reach oh, yeah. out, what would yeah, be thank the best way? Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, feel free. Please uh, connect to me on LinkedIn. Uh, my LinkedIn ID is Dan Sullivan PDX. Uh, yeah, that's that's great. Feel free to message me. Um, sometimes it takes me a day or two to get back, but I always try and get back to folks. Yeah, I'm sure you have 
quite a few connections. You're borderline influencer status on LinkedIn, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> considering all the courses uh, you've done and uh, all the books. So it's great uh, to have you on here. Now, my last question is, is a bit more theoretical. And I'm just wondering, when do you optimize and when do you just let good enough be? Um, you know, I am a big fan of good enough, uh, and incremental improvement. Um, yeah, I think, I think I opt for good enough early on because you also get feedback. Again, this is another parallel with software engineering. It's like, if you can get like a, you know, your minimum application out and start getting feedback from people, that's really helpful. Um, if you have like just the basic model, it's, you know, maybe a little bit better than your baseline linear regression, you know, that's, that's good enough. Like get, get it out, even if it's not in production, but like get it into the hands of the people who would use the, you know, the uh, results of that model to make decisions, you know, like find out how does it fit? Is it useful in answering the questions they have? Do you need, have you optimized? Are you, you know, classifying the wrong thing? Or are you doing a regression on the wrong variable and they really want to know something else? Um, or, or you, you might have missed something in the domain, and you need to tease something out. So, I, I, I'm a big fan for early, often, and in small increments. Wow, this has been so informative. I want to give you oh. a big thanks, everybody out there. If you want to check out his book, it's in the chat. If you're in Podcast Landia, then it's in the show notes. Or if you're watching us on YouTube later on, it's also in the description down below. Um, or if it's before Friday, go and tell us about your worst experience trying to clean data and you might win a free copy. Um, Dan, is there anything else you want to say before we go? No, just that, I, you know, thank you. I really appreciate this. I love talking about this stuff. I would just say, I think you mentioned the word expert. I just feel like I am definitely not an expert. You know, I feel like I'm constantly learning and I feel like, you know, it, it took me a while to realize I don't have to like know everything. And I, you know, so I just want to make, just advocate for, you know, get, cut yourself a break. You, you know, a lot already and it's, and it's, and you're doing well with it. So, uh, yeah, don't, don't, uh, push yourself to, to unrealistic levels. You know, I think we got to avoid that. So that's so cool. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate the humility on that too. It's so cool to talk to you and it's been so informative. You know, this is one, one that I feel like I was just learning the whole time and oh, everything that you said was, it really was for me, it was great to hear and internalize and go, yeah, okay. I have known a little bit about that, but we just went two layers deeper. Oh, yeah. Oh, great. So, well, I, I really, I'm glad it was helpful for you. I hope it was helpful for others too. And uh, yeah, anytime you want to chat, I'm always available. Right on. Yeah. Thank and, you. Uh, for, for those of you that are not in the Slack, we've got it in, in the chat, or you can just go to mlops.community and you'll find a link there. Um, maybe by the end of the week, we can convince Dan to jump in the Slack too. And he'll be oh, yeah. there. Yep, it's, uh, oh. it's there right on. Well, thank you again, Dan. Yeah. And I look forward to hearing everybody's responses. We'll be talking to see who the best response is that wins your book. <laughs> oh, that's great. I'm looking forward to it. And I'm sorry you've experienced those horrible <laughs> data <laughs> scenarios, but uh, it's, you know, that's, that's how, how you we learn. learn. That's yep, how you exactly. learn. There it is. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. Take care, Dan. Take care. Have a great day. Thanks. So long.